We're going to start more deacon and deaconess training and start people along that path. And I'm really excited about that. And we had a meeting last week and we had some people show up and it was just wonderful. And I'm really, really, really excited about beginning this process. In preparing for this class, though, I was doing research about the need for deacons and the need for all leaders of the church. And I came across a really interesting statistic from one of my readings. And it's in our particular denomination, back in the 1960s, both seminaries added together had about 1,700 guys that were preparing to become pastors. And I saw that number and I was just flabbergasted. When I went to seminary, which was about 20 years ago, we have one of the largest classes that the seminary had seen in a long time, but I think added together for both seminaries, there were maybe 250 guys per class. I mean, there was maybe 900, 800, 900 guys in both seminaries. This was back in the 60s. There were 1,700 guys in the seminary. And this wasn't because of the Vietnam War. I mean, later on, people started going to the seminary and going into these professions because they wanted to kind of avoid the draft, I guess. But this was the early 1960s. And there were that many people in the seminary. It was incredible. And the reason why I think it's incredible is because I went to a pastor's conference uh, last month. And if you add up the number of guys that are going to graduate from both seminaries this year, it's less than 50, I believe. It's not very big. So that means that there are maybe 200, 250 um, people preparing for full-time church work at our seminaries. I mean, that is a pittance compared to what it was in the 1960s. And it's, it's really kind of worried our denominational leaders. No, nobody's going to seminary. It's kind of a strange thing. And it's, it's not just our denomination. This is, this is across all denomination. I mean, I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to become a pastor. It's a fun job. Um, you know, people are nice. The board meetings are nice. Uh, there's never any church drama to deal with. And in our denomination, if you want to get, become a pastor, the, the gold standard, as they call it, right, is to, you know, pick up your family and move to St. Louis and live in a small apartment for two years. And then you pick up your family and you go and do an internship and then you pick up your family, you move back to St. Louis, and then you pick up your family and go to another place to serve full time. I mean, it's just a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, everybody loves to do that sort of thing. And it's a whole lot easier, you know, the larger your family is. I don't understand why more people aren't just going into church work. It's kind of silly. And as I've said, it's, it's across all denominations. There are a lot of people just looking at it and they're wringing their hands saying, what can we do? How do we get more people into church work in the future? Because how will the church survive if we don't have pastors? We need more of them. If they don't have a lot of wor workers, then how's the work going to get done? Well, today we start a new series to look at that question. And it's kind of based upon Isaiah 6. If you remember Isaiah 6, Isaiah is working as a priest in the temple and he has this vision from God. And the vision says to him, who is going to go for me? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. He was a priest. He was a prophet. And somehow today when I think we read these words, we think that this is only for priests or prophets. Many Christians believe that the only people that can do the work of the church are people who are like Isaiah, working as a priest, and then they're sent by God. But that's not how I read it. We've just finished a 14-week series looking at how the church structure operates. We looked at how God has called some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds, some teachers. We looked at the structure of the church. We looked at the gifting of the church. We looked at what the early church did. And if we only limit the work of the church to the people who are the professional called clergy, I think we're really, really limiting ourselves. Because when we hear, here am I, send me, a lot of people think, well, I know, that's my pastor, he is sent. 
But since the time of Jesus and the curtain temple was torn in two and we have the priesthood of all believers, I believe those words are for everybody. That Jesus calls all of us, who am I going to, who am I going to, who's going to go for me? And that all of us at some level need to step forward and say, Lord, here I am, send me. One of the challenges I want to bring up today is the challenge of doing that in a world that doesn't know Jesus. Now, I know what you're saying. It's like, well, we're a Christian nation. There's a lot of people here who know Jesus in a Christian nation. Well, that is true. And it is true that at the founding of our nation, the people that wrote the Constitution and put all the early legwork in, they were all Christians. But if you look at the world around us today, there are not very many Christians. There are a lot of people who say that they're Christian, but how many people truly get up on Sunday morning or invest themselves into the things of the church and in things invest themselves in the kingdom of God and actually truly follow Jesus and say, here I am I, send me, send me. Let me be your hands and feet in a world that so desperately needs it. I look at the church today in our current context, and I think it's kind of barren land. And it's very much like the early church was. Just put yourself back into the early church. Think about the church that was going and expanding into new territories, and these were places that didn't have Christianity beforehand, and how difficult it must have been for them to follow Jesus and to plant these churches and to start these new movements. It must have been very, very difficult. And it was difficult in places like Corinth. We've talked about Corinth before, but Corinth was a metropolitan megalopolis. There was a lot of trade. There was a lot of money. There was a lot of people there, and they were all people focused on themselves. And then you bring in Christianity, and it is a totally different way of thinking things. Instead of thinking about commerce and trade and the pleasures of this world, Jesus says to throw all that away and concentrate on me. Think about me. Love the world around you for me. It must have been an incredible challenge, but I think there's a lot of correlations between the world of Corinth and how I see the world of the United States today. And so we're going to look at one of Paul's letters to the church of Corinth. And in this letter, I think we're going to see three things. I think Paul's going to kind of diagnose the problem that the leaders were seeing there. He's going to talk about a solution, and he's going to talk about a fuel for the solution. So let's just look at that today, and we're going to look at Paul's first letter to Corinth. It's going to be chapter, 14, uh, chapter 4, and we're going to read in, begin reading at verse 14, where Paul writes this, I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. You see, this is the problem that you have when bringing the gospel into a land that doesn't have a lot of Christians in it. There's not a lot of Christian fathers. There's not a lot of people to imitate. Just think about it. You go and you bring the gospel to Corinth and there are not very many people that can share with you what the gospel of Jesus is truly about. And as Paul says, you might have a thousand, ten thousand people there that are eager for the gospel. They just don't know what to do. So you need leaders. You need strong Christian leaders. And if you don't have them, you have to start creating them. I was trying to think of an example of what this looks like. And for some reason... Lacrosse came into my, my head. Do you know what lacrosse is? Lacrosse is a game that you play. You have a lacrosse stick, right? And on the end of it is like this little cup. And then you have these balls. And you, you try to get the ball across the finish line using the stick and the cup and the ball. It's called lacrosse. And believe it or not, lacrosse started from the Native Americans here in the United States, in, in North America. I mean, it's, it's a very much, a very much American sport that was started by us. But you don't see it around that much because there's other sports like the NFL and, and basketball and, and baseball, all these other sports. It kind of leaves lacrosse on the sideline. 
Because if you wanted to play lacrosse, you have to develop a whole culture of lacrosse. Believe it or not, back in the Olympics, 1908 and 1912, they had lacrosse in the Olympics, but it was only America and Canada that entered any candidates. I mean, there may have been some others, but it was very, very much an American sport. And because it wasn't anywhere else around the world, it just didn't make it as an Olympic sport. My understanding is it's actually gonna come back at the next Olympics. They're gonna have official lacrosse. But it's taken all these years, why? Just think about how difficult it is to bring a new sport to the United States. You don't have coaches, you don't have funding, you don't have sponsors, you don't even have a lacrosse field, you don't have equipment manufacturers. I mean, all of these different steps that you need to have, and that's just in one country, and then you have to export this to all the other countries, and then they have to build up their teams, and they have to build up their expertise, and it take, may take years and years and years before you finally can bring lacrosse back to the Olympics because it's around the world enough to where you can actually compete against other nations at a very good competitive level. So they're gonna bring it back. But think about bringing Christianity to a place that has never seen Christianity before how difficult it is. You've got to have people that, that are going to have to learn about what it means to be Jesus and start living their life as a way to be Jesus. And then other people are going to imitate them. And then slowly over time, the Christian culture begins to infiltrate. It's like leaven in the culture that it starts to bring in the words of Jesus into the culture around them. And it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of molding and a lot of shaping. And so, this is what happens as Christianity comes into a culture. It just takes time. And it takes an understanding of the culture around you. We've had Christianity in the United States for so long that we think we understand how to bring Jesus to the people. To, to every new generation, but there are new generations out there that have such a totally different frame of reference about what it means to live in our world that to bring the words of Jesus really takes a complete shift of mind and understanding of who they are. I, just think about culture itself. A hundred years ago, or when I was a kid growing up, I could make a reference to a Beatles song or a Star Trek episode, and pretty much everybody in the culture would understand what I was talking about. But you fast forward to today, there is no central thing that everybody understands, that everybody can relate to. It just makes it harder and harder to try to bring something of a, of a cultural reference if you're not in that cultural reference. I mean, I've got some millennial kids, but I do not understand them. And all the other generations that come after me, what's needed are people in those generations who understand the teachings of Jesus and then can bring that teaching in a relevant way to the people around them. And it just takes time because the world around us is changing faster and faster. And so we have to be better at reacting and finding ways to bring the message of Jesus to every uh, culture. I, um, I think the, probably the biggest cultural icon we have today is Taylor Swift, right? Um, and uh, she seems to be something that pretty much everybody understands, but I'm not a Taylor Swift, so I don't even know what her songs are. And apparently there's this new quarterback, Travis Kelsey, an unknown Calder quarterback, a nobody, and now he's married to, you know, dating Kate Taylor Swift, and now he's a somebody, and, and you know, he's... Uh, He's going to have to learn how to live that kind of life in the spotlight. And who knows? Maybe his quarterbacking skills will be noticed. I have no idea. But we're in barren land. That's the problem. We're in barren land. We don't have all the cultural references at our fingertips that we used to have. We have to rebuild from the ground up every time you go into a new barren land or a new generation or a new people. It requires an understanding of that culture, and you have to begin to build that culture in that culture to reach people for Jesus who live in that culture. You need to start finding people who understand Jesus. But then what? So you find the people, but, but there's more to it. 
Just listen to what Paul says as he continues. In verse 17, he says, For this reason I've sent you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Now, this is profound. Timothy is a protege of Paul. Paul loves Timothy. These two are like father and son. And yet Paul is going to break that relationship and send Timothy to Corinth to start to help to grow the church in Corinth. And it must have been very painful for Paul and Timothy because, as I said, they they love each other tremendously. And yet, for the sake of the church to grow, they're willing to separate and send Timothy to the church in Corinth. See, the way the church operates today is we think more of replication. And what we mean by replication is, is that you have a church and it has a pastor. And then when that pastor is thinking about retiring or he does retire or gets, goes called somewhere else, then you bring in another pastor and he replaces that pastor. And the church over the last 1,500 years has had this replication mentality, which is here are the churches and we're, when someone leaves, we're going to replace them. But they couldn't do that in the early church. In the early church, they had a different mentality. It was a multiplication mentality. It was one in which they said, listen, we need so many people out in the mission field. We can't just replace. We have to multiply. And how do you multiply? You send some of your people into a place and they begin to multiply in that place. And it grows exponentially as opposed to growing non-exponentially or or linearly. You see, there's two ways to think about spreading Christianity. One is replication, and the other is multiplication. And multiplication is much faster. It's much more widespread. If you think about two, then it goes to four, then it goes to eight, then 16. It, it's, it's an explosive factor, and the early church had to do an explosive factor because they were trying to bring Jesus to the whole world. And so they were willing to go into that multiplying mindset because Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I think our whole church body has been in this replication mode for so long that we've forgotten that the early church was in the multiplication mode. They, They knew that they needed lots of people out in the field to spread the word of Jesus. And so they commissioned a lot of people to do that. As I was doing my research for the deacon classes, I came across the story of C.F.W. Walther. He is the father of our denomination, if you want to say that, to Carl Ferdinand Wilhelm Walther. And he was in charge of the seminary, and he was in charge of sending guys out from the seminary to the various churches. And all of a sudden, the churches were growing so rapidly, and they couldn't get enough guys into the seminary that one day he walked into the seminary and he pointed to some people and he said, like, to 10 people, you, 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 you're done with your seminary education. Go out and start being the hands of feet in Jesus. And he sent them out. They ordained him and sent them out. It's crazy to think about today. I mean, I would have loved to have gone out after one or one and a half years of seminary. But our, our structures in place today say, no, no, you have to have this much training and this much experience. You have to go to these places and there's so much controls on it that we would never, ever do that today. And yet when you're a multiplication mindset, these are the things you think about. Where's the need? Who can fill that need? Let's send them out. The problem is it's messy, right? Because you may not get everything done the way you want it to get done. You may not have all the education, all the training, all the things necessary to make sure that it gets done in a proper way. And that's the fear, right? Is will it be done in a proper way? But if you look at the early church and you look at Paul, he was in a multiplication mindset. He said, let's get people out into the field as quickly as possible. What were Paul's qualifications for sending somebody out, right? It, was, it wasn't how much education they had. It was what was your character, And where do you live and how quickly can we get you out into the world to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ? Those were the qualifications. Did they make mistakes? Absolutely they made mistakes. Did they recover from their mistakes? Absolutely, because the church is a church of grace. And whenever you're leading a church that's a church of grace, even the worst mistakes can be overcome and you can move forward. Because the important thing is the multiplication, 
It's not the replication. The important thing is reaching the world for Jesus. It's not to try to take the old processes and make sure they stay around for as long as possible. Is the church in Corinth still there? I have no idea. But I guarantee you that if it's not there, it's because the church went back to a replication mindset and not a multiplication mindset. Because when the church has the multiplication mindset, you can't stop it. It's the most wonderful thing it is. So the diagnosis is you're going into a new church area that doesn't have Jesus. So we need good, strong leaders. But then we need to multiply those leaders as quickly as possible so that they can be in a multiplicative mindset and not sit around in a replication mindset. But that's not all there is. There's one more thing. And Paul goes on in verse 20. He says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline or shall I come in love with a gentle spirit? The kingdom isn't talk, but it's power. What does this mean? I mean, isn't when you speak, isn't that speaking truth to power? Isn't there power in speech? I think so, yes. But when I look at this, I think Paul is kind of contrasting two things. He's talking about, okay, talking about Jesus, but then having the power of Jesus in your life. I think the power he's talking about here is the Holy Spirit. I think it's God's power. I mean, you can preach all you want about Jesus. You can act all you want about Jesus. But the power of the early church was the power of Jesus. It was the power of God's word. It was the power of his Holy Spirit. That's why Paul says a rod is useless. You want me to come with you a rod? All the rod can do is beat you over the head. But if you really, really, really want to change someone's life, it only happens with God's spirit. Luther says pretty much the same thing. He says the law only condemns. That's all the law can do is it can make you aware that you are a condemned, lost sinner in this world. But then God's love comes to you, and it's the power of the Holy Spirit that comes into you, and that changes your heart. And once the heart is changed, then everything else is possible. But it has to be a change of the heart. And the only person that can change the heart is God himself and his spirit. You know, as churches grow, we want power. We want to be in charge. We want to write the laws. We want to write the constitutions. We want it to be all about us. And we spend so much time trying to hold on to that power that we forget that we have no power anyway. <laughs> it's all Jesus. It's his power. It's his spirit. And that's the only power that can change a person. In fact, in your life, the only power that has changed you has been the power of God's Holy Spirit. You may think that you have the power to do all these things and that all the great things that you're doing is because you're such a wonderful person. No. You are, as Luther said, like dirty, filthy rags. The only thing you have in your life is God's power, and his power is what changes you. You have no power over your spiritual life. It's only God. And because God has brought you into the kingdom and his Holy Spirit is working in you, that power is in you, and that is the power that's changing you. And it's the only power that can change the world around us. See, the hardest thing to change is the heart. But once God's changed your heart, then everything else just falls into place. So we as a church should change people's hearts, but we do it with love. We, we change hearts through the power of God's grace and his power of, of the love of the people around us and the power of the Holy Spirit coming in to change those hearts. We don't have to be with the rod. We are there with love. And love is the only thing that can change. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, right? If you don't have love, you're just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. But with love, the power of God's Holy Spirit comes in and it changes the world. It changes the heart. I think I've told this story before, but it's probably been a long time. But I remember one time I was sitting in a church in Denver and a retired school teacher talked about how he gave and that he was giving, I can't remember, like 20 or 22% of his income to the church. And I had never heard that before. I'd, I'd heard that, you know, the goal was to try to get to 10%. And I was, 
barely, you know, on that path trying to get to 10%, let alone a higher percentage than that. But he spoke. He said, listen, God's changed my heart. And because God has changed my heart, I'm able to order my life in ways that please God. And I've ordered it in such a way that today I have all the things I will possibly ever need. And now I just want to spend the rest of my life just giving whatever I can to the church. And yes, it means it's a higher percentage than you might ever imagine. But God's loved me so much that I can't help but love the world around it. I had never heard that before. It completely changed my mind about about what resources God had given me and how I should order and restructure my resources in my life. And this is a dangerous place to be in your life when you finally realize that everything that you have is God's anyway. I mean, shortly after that, I decided to kind of pick up my family and move to the seminary and become a pastor. It's crazy. So be careful. Be careful what God can do in your life because when God is working in your life, the sky is the limit. That is what Paul said to the church in Corinth. It's barren land, so we need strong leaders, but we can't just replicate leaders. We have to multiply leaders. And the way that we multiply leaders is through the power of the Holy Spirit and love. And when all of that is in place, you can't stop the church. You can't stop Jesus because he is a movement that is unstoppable and the Holy Spirit is leading that movement. You know, I know that we've set up a lot of rules in many denominations to find leaders in the church. And most of those rules are good. And some of them, actually most of them are probably man-made. The rules work for a time, but then, like anything, they become such a part of our culture that we think that the rules are more important than the mission. But the mission is the important thing. And the mission is to raise up leaders who are willing to say, you know what, Lord, here I am, send me, send me. I don't know what that looks like, Lord. I don't know how you're going to use me. I don't know what gifts I have, what talents I have, what funds I have. But what I know is that you have loved me so much that you've come into my heart and changed it so much that when I hear this call, who's going to go? I don't know how, Lord, but I'm willing I'm willing to go. I'm willing to let you hear. I'm willing to hear your words in my life. Oh my, that every Christian on this earth would hear the words of God to say, yes, Lord, here I am. Send me, send me. I don't know what I can do. I don't know what my gifts are, but I know that you love me and I want to share your love with me to the world around. The one thing I know for sure is that you've loved me with an everlasting love. And I can't help but share that love with everyone I meet. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, thank you for your love. Thank you for this call. Who is going to go? Lord, let me go. In your name I pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I have a few announcements before we close. First of all, Christmas tea is coming up. So if you want to be a part of Christmas tea, it's coming up on December 3rd at 6 o'clock p.m. Mark your calendar. If you'd like to attend, uh, make sure you sign up for it. We're going to do another Discover CLV class after worship on the 12th, which is a week from today. Um, And we're also starting, you know, December is one of those times where there's lots of different needs in our community. So we've lumped them all together together. And we spend the whole month of um, November and half of December making you aware of those new needs and providing you opportunities for those needs. So today is the beginning of our uh, partnership with Resources, which is the local food bank, uh, where we'll give you an opportunity to provide funds for them. And then we'll provide them those funds. So those are the announcements. Oh, by the way, the modular expansion vote did pass. Uh, So we're moving full steam ahead on putting those modulars on our campus. Thank you for voting. Appreciate that. Uh, So those are the things that I wanted to share with you today as far as announcements. But I hope, pray that you have a great week in the Lord. Go in peace and serve the Lord with joy. Thanks be to God.